You are listening to the Pursuit of Manliness podcast, where we are vigorously equipping men to pursue biblical manliness. For more information or to secure your spot in our next session of Tribe, make sure you visit thepursuitofmanliness.com. God, thank you for uh, Brother John McDougall. Thank you for the ability for us to connect in this fashion. Now, this this conversation has been a long time coming, and we certainly trust you and your timing. We believe it's perfect. And in that, we trust that those who are going to hear this conversation, uh, they may come in contact with some things that we're going to talk about maybe for the first time. Maybe they're going to encounter Jesus in a new and fresh way. Uh, maybe they're going to uh, see biblical manhood or an understanding of what we're supposed to do while we're here on this planet. Uh, maybe they'll see it in a way that they haven't considered before. And, and we pray that no matter what happens, you get the glory in all this. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, men, at this time, I want to welcome John McDougal to the Pursuit of Mailiness podcast. Brother, thank you for making time being on the show. Great to be with you. Hey, man, it's been a long time coming. As I said, you are the author of Jesus Was an Airborne Ranger. Now, I know this isn't a brand new book hot off the shelf right now, but for me, I'm late to the game on most things. I finally came across this thing. So I, it is a fantastic read. And once I read it, I said, I need to get, get in contact with this guy. Let's start with the most obvious question. You don't really believe Jesus was an airborne ranger, right? For that guy who struggles with that title, right? It, it's a metaphor. I mean, that's what it is. And, and you know what? The Bible's full of metaphors. I mean, if we look at it honestly, um, you know, Jesus is the good shepherd. It's a metaphor. Um, uh, God is the vine dresser. Um, you know, uh, Jesus says, I'm the good vine. I mean, all, all of those things are metaphors. And so all we're doing is using a military, military metaphor to connect to military men and women. Which, which is perfect because the pursuit of manliness has a large first responders, military uh, draw. There's guys that are listening overseas that are serving. I'll hear from them through email, through DM, you know, guys that have been out of service. And so I think a lot of things that you talk about, this mentality of Jesus is going to be different for some people who maybe haven't encountered him in that way. You, you talk on page 25, um, this idea of Jesus, you talk about being a a consummate tactician. God surprised everyone by the way he chose to infiltrate his rescuer to planet earth. Uh, unpack that God being the consummate tactician here. Yeah. I mean, we, we see it in the old Testament. We see that God had a plan from Genesis three. I mean, when Adam and Eve sinned, there was a plan to, to rescue humanity. Um, and he took, you know, he took his time. He planned, he, you know, he, he prepared a family, uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, uh, then King David. I mean, he, he prepared a family. He prepared a nation to receive his rescuer. And so, yeah, he was, he was patient. Um, and I think that's a consummate tactician. Develop a plan um, and execute it when the conditions are right. I think he did that. I think, I think some people have a hard time with the aggressiveness of the Bible, you know, that like that, like God in a timing and, you know, that we need to call to, you know, there's a call to action. You talk about tactical patience and surprise, you know, there, there's an element to this and, and God certainly is, is the, the divine creator of all those things. You talk about the divine rescue or this great raid on planet earth of the incarnation. How is Jesus incarnation for those who are just new to this idea? How, how is this the great raid on planet earth? Wow. There's a, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, uh, yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, scripture talks about, um, Satan being the prince of this world. Um, and so in some, in some sense, uh, when, uh, when Adam and Eve failed, uh, we, we found ourselves ensnared by the enemy. Um, and I use the metaphor in the book, uh, you know, you, you might be familiar, your, your listeners might be familiar uh, with the raid on Cabanatuan in the Philippines in 1945. Uh, there were 550 allied POWs behind enemy lines in, in Japanese held territory. And uh, we sent the 6th Ranger Battalion behind enemy lines to liberate those POWs. Uh, they approached the camp. Uh, they, they took their time. It was three days moving in, in enemy held territory. Um, they assaulted the camp just after dark. Uh, they liberated the 500 POWs. And one man, uh, one Ranger lost his life in that effort. And I think that's a picture of Jesus, uh, that he would give his life on the objective uh, to rescue us from spiritual, um, spiritual darkness, but also spiritual en enslavement to the enemy. Absolutely. Uh, the, there, there was a point to him being here, and, and you can't argue with the fact that he was here. 
Uh, the Bible continually just elevates, you know, all the excavation efforts just continue to reinforce what we find in scripture, that there was a Jesus, that he did live. He did, you know, the disciples did die the way they died. So these stories, truth precedes truth. And so what you're, you're building on is, is kind of changing. It's one of the things we want to do here is kind of changing the narrative of who Jesus is. And we say is, cause not was he is, he is interceding on our behalf right now and use the language of um, the Rangers mission. And on page 68, you talk about that, that there's five things, a situation, a mission, execution, service and support, command and signal. Uh, when you think about Ranger mission and certainly your background, how do you see Jesus emulating this in his own life in the three years we have him here on planet or the three years of his public ministry? I mean, it, it, I think it's clear he knew from the beginning what he was there to do. Um, I mean, yes, he recruited a team. Yes, he taught. Yes, he did miracles. Yes, he fed, fed the crowds, the multitudes. Um, but he knew that his mission ultimately was uh, to move toward the objective, the objective being Jerusalem. Uh, he knew that he would make enemies along the way. And uh, he knew that that, that uh, mission would cost him his life. He told the disciples over and over, this is my mission. And they just simply didn't get it. And that didn't deter him at all. He, they didn't dissuade him. Um, he was focused on his task. I mean, it's all through the Gospel of Luke. He says again and again and again, he says, I must go to Jerusalem. I must suffer. I must die. And they didn't get it. And he said it again. Um, that's that's the type of um, single minded uh, uh, focus that we see in Rangers. Hey, give me a mission. Give me a task and purpose. And I'm going to fulfill it. And we see that in the life of Christ. At what point for you did this start to click? You know, I don't know your faith upbringing or when, when did it click for you that you see the correlation to what you're currently experiencing or what you've experienced in the past? in the juxtaposition of, of the life of Christ and saying he, he's doing a lot of the same things that we're being trained to do. And when I see that, uh, I, I want to be more like that. When, when was that turning point for you? Well, I tell you, there's been, um, there's been just little moments uh, along the journey where some pastor, some minister, some, uh, in fact, uh, Stu Weber, if you if your listeners are familiar with him, uh, Stu Weber came and spoke to a group of, of cadets when I was at West Point. And I just remember that being part of it. Um, I remember reading tender warrior, um, I remember, uh, you know, early as a young, young infantry lieutenant, I read Wild at Heart. I mean, some of these books started, started kind of planting that seed in my mind about who Christ is. And then really when I became a chaplain in 2010, I realized that, you know, two, two things were happening. One is we had Christians, young Christian soldiers, uh, paratroopers, rangers, who really had to make a hard decision. Hey, I was raised in the faith. I know who Jesus is. But I have to choose either between being a ranger, being tough and, and single minded focused and, and being a Christian, because those two for them seem to be in conflict. And I try to say, no, there, there isn't a conflict. Jesus was exactly as you're describing um, John 15, 13, you know, greater love has no one than this, that he would lay down his life for his friends. I mean, rangers get that paratroopers get that. Um, so I really Again, it developed over time, but I, I really felt like I needed to put some of those ideas that have been uh, formulating for me into some something to communicate that to these guys. Yeah, and I would say, if you're listening, read everything Stu Weber writes. It's fantastic, and it's just he just speaks directly to guys. You know, it's just a great, great uh, author. But let, let's talk on the front end before these guys get here, and maybe including yourself and others who are maybe walking this journey. Why, why do we have such this disillusioned view of what Christianity is or manhood? I mean, does it start in our homes? Does it start in the church? I mean, when these guys get here, why the tension that I can't be rough, tough, and, and fight for what matters and also be a Christian? You know, I think early in, in the Christian era, I think, um, you know, we, we understood that war was necessary, that evil existed and war is necessary. And so warriors didn't have a negative connotation. It was an essential part of life, no different than a physician. Uh, you know, you had to have warriors. I think as society has, I guess we can use the word progress, but maybe that's not the best word to use. Um, as we become a little more, we've, we're, we're distanced from war. Um, we, war for most Americans has been a foreign thing. We don't have to see it, touch it, taste it, smell it. Um, it, it's some other thing. And, and, and we've portrayed, and, and maybe, maybe in some good ways, we portrayed weight war as a negative thing. Hey, we don't want war. Um, we don't want to be a part of conflict. Um, but that I think is bled over to how we think about Jesus. And so we, we couldn't imagine him being a warrior. We couldn't imagine him being, being violent, um, being covered in blood. I mean, these, these are biblical images. Um, and so we, we've, we've sanitized Jesus 
uh, to go with kind of our sanitized culture. I, I have a, a much older friend of mine who is a, a uh, he's a veteran and he had made the statement and I'm not trying to get political, but he said, when the draft went away, I felt like so did a lot of our understanding of, of, of patriotism and things of like that. And people didn't have skin in the game. Like you used to have, you used to have a son or multiple sons or relatives. And, you know, on my side of the family, I got a ton of people who served in various forms. And so the idea is, well, if we all just play nice, the bad guys will stay away. Uh, yeah. The Bible's pretty clear. It does not work that way. Uh, that, that's the reality. Yeah. Yeah. As I write in the book, I mean, if anyone knows about evil, it's God. God understands the severity of evil. He understands, you know, the, 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 the saying goes that the only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. And in this case, I put good men in capital. That's, that's, that's Christ. Mm -hmm. You know, Christ, God, the father, they knew that if we do nothing, this planet dies, that everyone we love dies, um, that they are destined for, for spiritual slavery and death. And so we're going to do something about it. And it's going to be violent. And it's going to be bloody. And it's going to cost us something. But that's what love does. Uh, love, love takes risks. Love goes out on a limb. Love puts their, puts their body in, in harm's way. We talk a lot about men are to be men of presence. That when you show up somewhere, whether it's church, community, whatever, you're, you're in your, you know, whatever it is, your presence should add value. Not arrogance, but presence knows that I can take out the garbage. I can stand yeah. up and pray if I need to. I, I'll do whatever needs to be done. Yeah. We are called to do, to, to be. And, and you say this on page 79, this idea that we have a purpose and a pursuit. You said only in this pursuit will we find uh, the life of, of meaning, purpose, and fulfillment that we were created for and we so deeply desire. I mean, from my perspective, why does it feel like so many people are just trying to die safely? Why are we afraid of living this adventurous, sold out life for Christ? Yeah. Man, you use the word fear. And, you know, I, I, I coach my, my soldiers. I, I, I say, you know, fear is always connected with loss. You know, what are you afraid of losing? And I think the bottom line is we love this life too much. Um, and, and the scripture talks about that, right? Whoever loves his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. I think that's it. When you, when you stop fearing death, you know, I just read yesterday was the patron, uh, the, the feast day for the St. Saint, Saint Damien, uh, Damien, may, perhaps is how you say it. Um, and he was for 16 years, he lived among lepers. And when asked, you know, are you afraid to lose your life? He said, I've already lost it. I've already given it up for Christ. So to lose this life is nothing. Um, I've already died. You know, Paul says for, for me to live as Christ and to die is gain, right? He understood that it's, it's not me who lives, but Christ lives in me. Um, and, and I think, yeah, exactly. As you said, we love this life too much and we're afraid to sacrifice. Um, I, I think we need to love Christ too much. And then, then the sacrifice becomes easy. It just dawned on me the other day. I remember uh, have, having a moment where I thought, am I ever going to figure this thing out? Like, am I, you know, I just keep getting in the way of myself and, uh, and I don't believe in doing this. Uh, so I'm not condoning, you know, just like, it's not a Rubik's cube or a magic eight ball, but I just opened the Bible and it doggone if Galatians two twenty wasn't right there. Uh, it's no longer I who live, but Christ that lives within me. And I think we, we forget that, you know, we, we are old. We've died to our old self. We have this new life buried with Christ raised to walk in a new of life. And, and, and I think we, we were selling people a bill of goods that um, just play nice or just keep your head down, your mouth shut. And, and, you know, but we're called for so much more. Jesus yeah. never called anyone to stay in the hammock. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I look at men today and I, I think men are longing for purpose and mission and even conflict. And it's frustrating because it comes out in unhealthy ways. You know, we see men getting irritated in traffic and they can't seem to control it. And they explode over the smallest things. It's because you were made for conflict, but not with those you love, not with those inside your home, um, not with those in your community. It's with evil. And so we need to be engaged in that fight. That's that's what we were made for. Um, you know, we were made as defenders and protectors. Um, and we we need to. Well, as I write in the book, I mean, if. The first lie that Satan tries to convince us is that he doesn't exist, that there is no evil that needs to be stopped. Um, and then they, men, yeah, then men get sold a, yeah, life is about comfort. Uh, I had a friend recently tell me that the, the, um, the false God of America is comfort, um, that we, we look for a life of ease and simplicity. But when we find it, we realize we're not content. Uh, we were made for more. We were made for this mission that, that we talk about. 
you talk about one of the, the ways that we start to have that awaken within our soul is the idea of serving other people. This life cannot be about me. It has to be about other people. And it doesn't matter your skill set. It doesn't matter your season of life. I mean, people say, well, I'm 70, 80 years old. Listen, in scripture, the older they got, the more intense the tax became and the more greater kingdom opportunities were presented in front of them. And you wrote on page 84 down at the bottom, he says, God seems to recruit common people with normal abilities to participate in his extraordinary undertaking here on earth. What happens when a guy says, God, use me. I don't know if I'm good at anything. I, yeah. boy, I've made a mess of this thing. Just use me for whatever you want to do. I mean, the, the first thing that happens is that God says, all right, you know, you, you got it. You know, I, I will use you. And I think exactly right. I mean, you look at the 12 disciples, nobody had anything great to offer. There were plenty of other candidates. I'm sure that people laughed at the people Jesus chose. I mean, it was the band of misfits. Um, you know, it was the it, Island of misfit toys. Um, but, but he used every one of them and not just in the three years he walked with them for years after that. And these men's, their stories still resonate. I think that speaks to what happens when men say I'm all in. Um, is, is exactly that. Um, I think the other thing that happens is they find their purpose. I mean, I think about Simon Peter, like, what's my purpose? Well, it's to fish. Well, great. I love to fish too. Like there's, there's great joy in that. But I think even, even, you know, uh, uh, sailing off the shores of, of Capernaum there, I think he was going, man, was I meant for more? And maybe one of your listeners is, is doing the same thing, man. Was I meant for more than just, just raking in a paycheck and, and paying a mortgage? And the answer is yes. Yes, you were. Um, and, and Peter found that James, John, Andrew, uh, they, they found a life of more in Christ. I'm thinking about you talking about those disciples. If I was the recruiter, I would have went for Nicodemus. You know, he's already got the end. He's got a fear of God at least. And I'd have went after the rich young ruler. He's young. He's got money. I mean, come on. He, if we could, if we could convert that guy. Yeah. We got something here. Now he didn't do that. He went with the guys who said, almost like David, when he ran from Saul, God sent him about 300 guys who had nothing to offer emotionally unbalanced. They had no money, no friends, no nothing. And these men through time and engagement became warriors, became yep. men who said, Oh, it's time to mount up. Let's, let's do something about this. And God will do that with any of us if, if we're willing, you know, but one of the things I think men struggle, like we want accountability, we want community, but the truth is if we're not accountable to ourselves, we're never going to be accountable to anyone else. And you talk about winning the, the personal battles and you say, uh, if we don't win our one-on-one -on -one matchups, we're useless in the larger battle. If you unpack that winning a one-on-one -on -one matchup, because God's created us for community. How, how do we do that? Yeah. Though, I mean, the one-on-one -on -one matchup that I talk about is, is your own, your own spiritual struggles, your own temptations, your own, um, um, flaws and failures. It's, it's, it's calling on the Holy spirit every day and saying, father, I can't do this. I can't do this on my own with, without you, I'm going to fail. It, it's, it's avoiding those sins that destroy so many men, right? The secret sins that, that, that consume us and destroy our marriages and our, and our, and our um, livelihoods and our, our, our futures. And um, that's the one-on-one -on -one battle. And then the next battle is to fight for your family. The next battle is to fight for your family and community. Yeah. I'm thinking in your world, you have people in positions to call out every form of weakness or any, you're basically building men to become what you know they can be. And you're calling things out of them that they don't see in themselves. Even if they don't even have any, they're thinking, there's no way I could possibly do this. Years later, they, they, I don't know if it's ever happened to you, but I'm sure some of them have thanked you for what you guys have done or going back and said, man, you saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. What you're talking about here is, is taking a, a spiritual inventory of, how am I sabotaging myself? What kind of relationships do I possess? Or what, kind, what ways am I wasting my time? Uh, I'm, I'm sure the way that you start your day every day is a very disciplined regiment so that you know these things are in line. How do, we, how do you start that wake-up call in, a, in a, a young man that doesn't – he's content with being content? I, I think you, you spoke to it, um, I mean, in the military metaphor, right? Nobody does this alone. Uh, nobody starts the military journey and says, well, I'm going to just do it via correspondence. I'm going to do it from, my, from the privacy of my own home, own home. You can't do the spiritual life in isolation. It was meant to be done in community. You know, I look, I look at us in, you know, my first jump out of, a, out of an airplane, you know, down there at Fort Benning, Georgia. Um, and maybe some of your listeners have done that. You know, you don't think you can do it. But then you see the 10 or 12 guys in front of you and they're all exiting. And there's this positive peer pressure that gets you out that door. And I think the same thing is true in the Christian life. It's a, hey, I don't know if I can do this, 
But then I look to my left and right and I see brothers in arms who are doing the same thing and go, how are you making it? And I, say, I don't know, brother, I'm just making it today. And you go, okay, I can draw strength from that. I can draw strength in numbers and say, well, I can make it today too. Think about Mark Batterson's book, Win the Day. He says, can you do it for a day? If you can just do it for the day. And for some guys, it might be, can you do it for the hour? You know, can we yeah. do it for the hour? Can, can we win that hour and move on to the next one? Uh, it's, it's very real, but we're, we're better in community. I'm sure for you and for the guys that you lead, you look to the left and right. And there's inspiration seeing others, you know, be a part of something bigger than themselves. And, and you yeah. talk about this, this call to arms. This is much bigger than you use Hebrews, you know, chapter 12. You said, you know, we run the race with endurance that's set before us. Uh, we fix our eyes on Jesus and we remember the difficulties that he faced so we won't get weary or, or give up. How does that model how does that light a fire in you and in us to, to run this race, race faithfully? Man, I, I love that, that passage. That is just one of my favorites. I mean, we can all relate to the metaphor of, of running a race. Um, there's a start, there's some hard miles in between, and there's a finish line. And we don't know where that finish line is going to be. Uh, so run faithfully until you get there. But it's not, you know, if you just stopped at verse one, you'd think that it was up to you. You know, it was up to your own strength. But then it goes on to say, you know, fix your eyes on Jesus the author and perfecter of our faith, who've run this race before us, right? And so it's remembering that Christ ran it. Now, he ran it perfectly. None of us will. Uh, but along the way, like we're talking about, along the way, you find other journeyers, you find other um, runners who are doing the same thing and say, hey, brother, I don't know if I can make another mile. And just, hey, hang on my hip. Just stay with me for a bit. We'll run. We'll run for a little bit longer. And that's, that's a perfect metaphor that soldiers can relate to um, because we run, all, we run all the time. One of the things you do at the end of these chapters, which I think is important as a guy who likes to read books, I don't have time for it, but I, I need to stop and do it is the after action review. And I say that as an illustration, because oftentimes we're going through life so fast day in, day out, living for the weekend, vacation, whatever, that we don't actually pause and review. And your chapter calls us to do that. Every chapter causes us to say, all right, let's unpack what we just went through. How does that change the way that we walk with Christ? If we're willing to push pause every once in a while and just review the week, day, month, year, whatever. Yeah, it, it's the only way you get better. I mean, that, that phrase after action review is exactly what we do in the Army. After every live fire, after every jump, after every exercise, you know, we, we pause and we say, all right, what went well? What are things we want to repeat next time around? And what didn't go well? What could we do differently? What could we do better? You know, um, what do they say? The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and hoping for a different result. Um, I mean, we, we have to pause and ask ourselves those questions. And those questions can be done in indiv individual, but they can also be done in community. Connect with a, a, a brother, a team, a, a, a pastor, a, a friend, and, and just say, hey, I'm, I'm struggling with this question, or how would you answer this? Um, that's really what it's meant to do, and that's the only way we get better. Hey, would you just, as we begin to wind down here, would you just speak to that guy? He's, he's, he's got his earbuds on. He's driving his truck. He's, he's deployed overseas. Maybe his wife just told him some bad news. His kids don't talk to him, whatever. How, how do you begin to light this fire in him to give him a better understanding of Jesus and a better understanding of the mission that he's called to? Yeah, I think, I think really for that, for that individual, for that uh, young man, older man, doesn't matter. Um, you know, there's, there's two realities about, about Jesus. The first is that he's coming to rescue you. And so whatever trap, snare you find yourself in, whatever dangerous situation you find yourself in, Christ is the rescuer and he is coming for you. He's coming behind. You know, I think about those 550 allied POWs behind enemy lines. There had to be moments. They were there for over three years. There had to be a moment where they said this hopeless, you know, that there's no future here. And I, I'm sure that we can, we can relate to that from time to time. But then the second thing is this, not only did he come to rescue, he came to call you on mission. You know, he came to get you out of the POW camp, clean you off, put you in a clean uniform and then, and then send you out with him again. Um, and so, whether you're looking to be rescued from something or you're looking for a mission to be a part of, Jesus provides both. Amen. It's the only way you're getting off this planet alive, you know, <laughs> surrendering to Christ. That, that's it, man. Hey, brother, I know we had a lot of moving pieces. I'm glad we finally got to land. The book is Jesus Was an Airborne Ranger by John McDougal, Chaplain, U.S. Army Rangers. You're a busy guy. You're a godly man. I'm thankful we're on the same team. Thanks for being on the show, brother. Pleasure's mine. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the Pursuit of Manliness podcast. If you would, make sure to visit iTunes and leave a five-star review to let others know what you think of this show. When you get a chance, make sure to visit thepursuitofmanliness.com to see what is available in the gear store, find more information out about Tribe, and much more. 
Thanks for listening, and let's keep pursuing biblical manliness. Mm-hmm.